blaming something else. But when you get to be an adult, stop blaming. See? Take responsibility for your feelings and your emotions. <clears throat> and as a leader, that's just mandatory that you do so. Now, with this approach now, when people come to me and I'm counseling, I'm working with them, <clears throat> and they say that they get angry. Now, look at the attitudes towards burnout. That's another thing we'll talk about in just a moment. But burnout is another form of uncontrolled anger. It's another form of uncontrolled anger. Burnout. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But when I look at this, I say, okay, if that's true, that means that if I'm angry now, then I can look at the source. What's the threat? You see. If this is true, I can live by this, and I think it is. Then I can say, okay, I'm angry today. What's the threat? Instead of blaming somebody or the weather or whatever, or God or whatever, now I'm going I'm to look at myself and say, what is the threat I feel today? Do I feel a threat in this situation, in this relationship, and what have you? And if I do, what is, it, what is the threat itself? Is it real? Or is it more imaginary? Does it reflect more on my insecurities and my lack of knowledge of truth? Or does it reflect on me because I'm so weak I have to blame somebody else? What's the threat? And I challenge you to do that every day. Begin to look at yourself and say, what, am I, what is the threat I feel because I'm angry today? And how do I deal with that threat? Do I have to go to the person and work through it? Do I have to see it as something that really isn't a threat at all because in reality it doesn't affect me unless I let it affect me and control it? Do you really want to be able to be free of being controlled by your emotions? See, most people come to me for counseling, they are controlled by their emotions, otherwise they wouldn't be coming to me for counseling, right? And once they go through this, if they stay with it faithfully, once they reach the other end of this training, the relief of not being controlled by their emotions anymore is such a powerful thing, it empowers. Leaders need to understand this as well as fathers and mothers. Because I see more out of control moms and dads and leaders today than I've ever seen in many years. And I can't nail down exactly what all the reasons are except for our self-indulgent world and our self-pleasing world. And so whenever something is a threat to me being pleased today, guess what? Here we go, say. Kids are a threat, why? Well, because they're disrupting my comfort. Or they're a threat because I have to pay attention to them and I want to do something else. These are all threats. And so members now are a threat to me because I'm a positional leader. How are they threat to you? Well, they're causing problems over there. They're not exactly doing the goose step I want them to do, you know. They're not exactly falling in line like I want them to fall in line. We've got some of these independent characters, you know, that have ideas and they have vision. We don't want to go, you know, all that kind of stuff is a threat. I got a preacher, it's a threat. Why? Well, because he's too popular or he doesn't always want to do exactly what I want him to do. See, those are positional kinds of attitudes because we don't think in terms of working through things and helping people and building people up, we think in terms of how does it affect me? What does it mean to me? Now tomorrow we're going to get into dysfunctional families. We'll talk more about that. But this one thing I want to mention right now, one of the biggest problems in dysfunctional families is not knowing how to problem solve. And so, in a dysfunctional family, they don't learn how to problem solve because there's the primary stressor in that family who controls everything and he doesn't allow problems to exist because it's a threat to him, see. So he pushes them on the road or denies them. And so the kids never learn how to problem solve. So they grow up and they've never learned how to problem solve. They get married and guess what? Dysfunctional children, they grow up, guess who they married? Ah, oh, you guessed it. They're the dysfunctional children. Because they can see, they have sonar, sonar, they've got radar, they can see in the eyes and hearts of these other children they feel just as incompetent and weak as they do. And so they don't want to associate with the so-called upper elite, more control, more into it, more whatever than they are. So they draw to those who have more weaknesses. And so they get married and all of a sudden they got a problem. Now if you have a marriage that has no problem, you're in good shape. <laughs> so they get married and have a problem. And now what do they do? Instead of solving the problem, working through it, making compromises when they need to, and developing those things to where they all come out to the, a, a solution that meets everybody's needs. It doesn't necessarily make everybody happy, but it's a solution that works to make harmony. They can't do that because it's a threat. The very idea of a problem is a threat. 
Just think about a problem's a threat. And now you're married to somebody or a problem's there, so what do you do? You deny, you blame, you accuse, you throw a fit, you're out of control, and all the time you're trying to somehow avoid problem solving. So you got two people who are afraid, scared to death of problem solving, and they got a problem. That's why they come to counselors. The same thing's happening in the church. We've got elders that are afraid of problems because it disrupts the continuity of the institution. So it's a threat to them. They get angry about it. You see. <clears throat> the idea of problem solving is so powerful in terms of working towards solutions and in a body, in an organism, that's the only way it can operate. Because you look at 1 Corinthians 12, we'll talk about it tomorrow. In 1 Corinthians 12, there is always a compromise, isn't there? What is the compromise? The weaker depend upon the stronger, and the stronger are always there to build up the weaker. Who's compromising? Well, I suppose the stronger, right? But look at that, look at that tonight. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. Because he's talking about the parts that are beautiful and comely and strong. They're always there working towards building up the weaker ones. That's a compromise because you can't be self-interested. You can't be self-consumed and absorbed if you've got to build up the weaker ones. But that's what a body does. And if we're leaders of positional mindset, we're going to get involved in that because that's kind of messy stuff, isn't it? I don't want to get involved, if I'm a positional kind of leader, with people who have problems, try to work through their solutions. That's just a lot, that's a lot of pain and stuff. That's a lot of difficulty. It, it, that means I've got to be more vulnerable. And I've got to, but I can't be vulnerable because I've got a lot of insecurity, and so I don't want to do that. So it's easier to be a positional leader and sit with other elders and make decisions and then throw out edicts. And if we have some problem areas out there, well, you know, that's the way he's been, so let's go shut him down. Or maybe it might be the point that he's a pillar in the church. We can't shut him down, so let's go ahead and accommodate him. You ever see that happening in families? We accommodate kids because of our own insecurities. And we use kids sometimes to make us feel better, or what have you. So, uh, and we use kids because we don't want to have to go through the trouble and the pain and the suffering and the discomfort of actually making, helping church kids grow Helping them to develop, helping them to, to understand right and wrong, helping them to make the right choices, helping them to be God's people. Doing what Solomon said. Raise up a child the way he should go, he'll not depart from it. That takes work. It's the raising up the child that's the problem, he said. It takes work. I have to be involved with my kids. I have to spend time with them. I have to be strong at times when they don't want me to be strong. I have to be strong at times when they cry and groan and, groan and complain and whatever. I have to be strong because I know that's what's best for them. You see? But it's messy stuff, isn't it? It's uncomfortable stuff. And, and, and I don't want to have to go through all that. I want life to be easy for me. We live in a happiness society today. We have a lot of happy churches, don't we? In fact, the churches that are happy are the ones that are growing right now. You know, the happy churches. You know, you probably know some of the happy churches. You may not think you're in a happy church right now. I don't know. <laughs> but the happy churches are the place to go. You know, those community churches, you know, they're the, they're the, they're the places to go. They never tell you what's wrong with you. They never talk about hell. They never talk about the Bible half the time. They always want you to be happy when you leave. Because that sells, you see. That's good marketing. What person who's trying to sell a product to you wants you to be unhappy about it, right? So that's good marketing. Make them happy. If you turn to chapter 2, I don't have to if you want to, but turn to, turn to chapter 2 and look at the church in Sardis in the book of Revelation. And Jesus is commending them. Is it Smyrna? I'm sorry, it's already forgot. Maybe Smyrna. But Jesus is commending them because they're, they're standing strong. Most of the churches he rebukes heavily, the seven churches. Then he said, But I want you to be aware of this. Many of you are going to be put in prison, and some of you are going to die for the cause. Now, can you imagine Micah coming up tomorrow on Sunday? Saying, I just got a letter from the Apostle, from the apostle John, and I want to read it to you. And this will probably take place in the sermon today. Here's the letter to the Church of Moses Lake. The government's turning against Christianity.